do with the disciples and the Lord Jesus Christ in the upper room and the events as Jesus begins to prepare them for what was just waiting but just hours ahead of them. Then from the upper room, which is situated up on Mount Zion, disciples left there. Jesus continued his discussion with them where we get John 13, 14, 15, 16, even 17. As they get up to Gethsemane, which we spoke about last week, they've walked across Kidron Valley, portion of the way up the Mount of Olives, and there was an olive grove there, which was with a garden known as Gethsemane. Now, the idea wasn't just like a garden. We think of a garden. It most likely was a place where they did the manufacturing and bottling and preparation of olive oil, where it would be pressed and then pressed again and pressed again like we talked about last week with the, with the preparation of these these olive oils to be prepared for market and for retailing. Most likely in an area like that that Jesus went, there had been some covered areas, there had been private area where he went away and was praying. And we talked about last week that all that he endured and the reason of Gethsemane and just how horrific it really was due to what he was facing with that cup. Gave some brief description last week, which would probably never suffice accurate description of just how horrific and how horrible that cup was as Jesus looked into it and beheld what I called last week the abominations of mankind, rebellion against God, the sins of all men from the ages down to where he was, kind of a vomitous kind of mixture and pit that faced him there that was so horrifying. Also to behold himself in taking that cup where he now understands, it, did understand before, becomes even so much clearer to see just how the iniquity that he's getting ready to become, the he who knew no sin, the Bible says, became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That this cup is so horrible that he's getting ready to take up. But not only does he see the sin and the, the wickedness of mankind, he also beholds himself becoming the substitute for our sins, the culprit, the lamb that would be laid on the altars, the sacrifice, the curse becoming, coming on him as he becomes the sin for us who knew no sin. He who knew no sin becoming sin for us. But not only that, having to fight probably uh, the greatest assault of Satan upon him since his days on the earth, probably even more tremendous than even the assault in the wilderness. As he in Gethsemane in the darkness that moment begins to deal with the pressures and the agonies of it, so much so that he begins to sweat great drops of blood. That's where we left you last week. You know, and I've had the blessing and the privilege and the opportunity to be in Israel and to be in Jerusalem at some of these locations, whether it's the specific location and latitude and longitude of the actual event or not, probably within 100 yards or 100 feet of the actual places where all these events especially have unfolded to us in the last days and last weeks as we look at the cross and where he's going, to be able to stand in those places and somehow sense, you know, what was going on. And there's really nothing like it. And those who've been to Israel with us on those trips or perhaps with some other group, you know what I'm talking about, to stand in those places like Gethsemane, to be in those moments and to have that kind of, I don't know, just the very atmosphere of a place like that to, to, to begin to understand all the Lord Jesus has done for us. I, I've taken probably 20 different groups there and walked into that garden so many different times. And I don't think I've ever left once where every eye was not wet to some degree and every heart broken to some degree to remember all the Lord Jesus Christ did at Gethsemane. In leaving Gethsemane, the Lord Jesus goes out to awaken his disciples one more time and he walks out. In Matthew 26, here's the description. He says, he came to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us go. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Now, here's the Lord Jesus. Not, not ever once does he's trying to escape what he knows is ahead of him. We talked about the cup, perhaps that horror of that cup, but never, want, never wanting, I believe, to, to escape what was before him and knowing that redemption is at hand, the price for your sin, for my sin, salvation has to be purchased. And he's getting ready to lay down his life. But look at him as he comes out of this terrible time and like so much pressure and so much uh, of the heaviness of that moment. He still comes out, wake him and say, it's time. Let's move forward. Let's be about the Father's plan. Let's go do what God the Father has set out for me to do. Those who are, who are, who are I'm being betrayed in their hands, they are here. Let's move forward to that moment. 
And I want you to kind of see that whole attitude of the Lord Jesus in all of this with Gethsemane on to the cross, really from the beginning days of his ministry, even back when he's 12 years old, when he says, I must be about my father's business. Let's look at Jesus today. And as we go through these moments, remember these last hours, it is still dark. The morning has not broken. The edge of Passover is here. The sacrificial lambs are going to be taking up in the early wee hours of this morning up to, the, up to the temple to be presented to the priest for inspection and review. And as we break forth here in the evening, I mean, the dark of the night is still there. Here we have the Judas becoming, coming with the disciples and um, with the, the men from the temple, the soldiers from the temple, the, those apart, probably a few of the Roman soldiers may be there. We don't know, but we do know that there are those who've come to arrest Jesus and to take him at force if necessary. And we lead us to this point from Gethsemane. We're coming out of the garden and they're standing there. And it's this point of arrest. And Luke 22 puts it this way when it talks about Judas who comes to betray Jesus with a kiss. While he was speaking, behold, a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about Judas today because I want to talk about that more next week. And I want to talk about Peter's betrayal. And I'm going to hold those two up side by side for us to look at. Judas and to look at Peter because we see both men betraying and denying the Lord Jesus at this point and betraying their commitment to Christ at this point. But we see completely two different outcomes and say, so I really want to cover that more next week as we talk about it because it's really important to see the difference between just real repentance and just remorse. But here's Judas, and he's, he's made a deal with the, with the high priest and with the Sanhedrin. He betrays the Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. In John 18, we pick it up here as the rest is taking place. So Jesus, knowing all things were coming upon him, he went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered and said, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am. Now, he in the, is in italics in the print of your Bible because it's just there for understanding's sake. This is a declaration of his deity. It's that name by which the Jews knew God is. When Moses said, who do I say is sending me back to release the children of, Egypt, the, of Israel from the bondage of the Egyptians? The Lord said to him, you tell him I am sent you. And Jesus makes this declaration, I am. And when he does, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore, again he asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus, the Nazarene. And Jesus answered, I told you I am. So if you seek me, let these go their way to fulfill the words which he spoke of those whom you've given me. I lost not one. Now, this is amazing as you see the Lord Jesus in moving in, in this regard now with, a, with his, his, this, this certain intention and this, this genuine focus of mind, heart, body, soul to offer all that he is for the sins of mankind. They come to arrest him and he declares before them, I am. At the same time, making note to the fact that those who are with him, he's still moving in, a, in, in this shepherd ministry, in this, this shepherd role of loving and caring for his disciples, seeing that they don't come along, that they are not arrested, that they're not part of the, of the, the process. He isolates himself, really to isolate himself, is to show that he really is the only offering that will be acceptable to God. And so he makes himself available. But Catch in the midst of this arrest process what is happening. You see here at the declaration of the I am, this declaration of deity where he declares himself really to be God. Anybody that tells you Jesus never said he's God hasn't read the Bible and certainly hasn't read the Gospels because he makes this declaration several times of who he is throughout this, this process. I am or I am he. And it says when he said that, they fell to the ground. I mean, they're, they're just blown away literally, physically as well. They're, they're knocked back at the presence of deity, at the, at the declaration. So I want you to see it. Here, here's this man who, who already looks worn and beaten, all right, covered in blood because he's been praying and sweating these great drops of blood that we talked about last week. He's standing there in agony. In fact, the Bible tells us, he says, I am just, there's so much agony that I'm enduring. I'm about to die. I believe that's when God opened up the, the window of heaven and sent that angel to minister to him. And he ministers to him. Now Jesus has been refreshed by this angel, comes out, and he makes again this declaration. Here he is as a man. I mean, feeling everything, the intensity, the pain, being the horrific sight before him, but at the same time, God. 
Remember, remember, he's God in the flesh, he, and he lives his life as a man, but yet he's still God. And the only time that God is manifest is God, the Father gives him permission to manifest his glory. And you see that happening in various instances where he moves in, in, in the miraculous realm and his deity is attested to. But only as the Father gave him permission and only as the Father directed him. He said, I only do what the Father tells me to do. And I only say what the Father tells me to say. Whereby he modeled for us what a life of faith really is all about, all right? Where he, with an absolute reliance upon his Father. And now he stands forth as this man, wounded already by this pressure that he's been sensing and dealing with in prayer. He still stands up and declares his deity and with so much authority that these men fall back. So you see a little bit of the glory of God. And I don't want you to lose sight of that as we go through this message this morning, that here's a man as an offering for our sin, but yet he's very God in the flesh. And the glory of God is, 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 is upon him as he, pro, as he goes through the process. Now you remember, if you've read the story or saw the movie, that you, you remember how Malchus reacts at this, and as he reacts to arrest the Lord Jesus and how Peter at that point during this arrest responds to that and he pulls out his sword and he slices off the ear of the, of the, of the high priest's servant. It says, Simon Peter, having a sword, he drew it and struck the high priest's slave, cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. Now here's Peter responding because he told him before, even though he didn't quite keep up during the prayer meeting, he kept going to sleep. He didn't watch and pray lest he enter through temptation. He moves in response now by pulling out his sword, I'm going to stand with the Lord to the death, and slices off Malchus's ear. Again, I want you to see the beauty of the Lord Jesus and all this response and all this activity. He tells Peter, you know, to put the sword up, stop it, no more of this. And then he touches the servants here and he heals him. And these men are here to destroy him. These men are here to arrest him. These men are here to do harm to him. Can you imagine what that did to Malchus at this point? I don't know what his intentions were. I'm sure he is the high priest, have gotten the incendiary reactions from the high priest about what they want to do to Jesus, and he's ready to go be everything he can be for God, all right? At least for this religion he, that, he, that he's serving. And he steps out and brings his arrest, and his ears cut off, and he's probably screaming with pain. And the Lord Jesus, in the midst of that, reaches out and ministers to him heals him, touches him. Again, you get a little bit of grace and glory and presence of, uh, of Jesus and who he is and what he does. He says, I didn't come to, to, to be served, I came to serve. I didn't come to get, I came to give. And there he is, even in the midst of those who are arresting him. And we'll see it to, the next Sunday when we get to the crucifixion, on the Sunday after that, we talk about more specifically on the crucifixion, where we see him offering himself up as that lamb, and he puts his arms out on the cross and says, no man takes my life from me, but I give it willingly. You see the same gracious, loving, gentle, precious, holy, magnificent Lord Jesus in the middle of all this critical, tense moment that's happening. Everybody's freaking out, I'm sure. They just come out of a cold sleep. Here's Jesus ministering in his grace. And then he's led away from there to a place called the house or the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest, to get there. And I'll read that passage in a moment. But if those who've been there and have been a part of that know that he had to leave, you know, those who went with me on the trip, we would go from Gethsemane over to Caiaphas' palace. We took a bus, all right? There's no bus being presented on this evening. They walked from that point, and maybe 15 to 30 minutes, depending uh, uh, where he was in, on the part of the Mount of Olives where the garden actually was. They take this walk around, and they have to go around the valley of Kidron, and as they cross Kidron, then they got to come up through the center of a place called Hennem, the Valley of Hinnom. Now this is where back before uh, the idols were torn down of Moloch and these gods, these, there was a grove down there filled with these, these idolatrous pagan altars. And of course under righteous kings those were torn down and became a smoldering place. Ultimately it became the garbage pit. In fact it became the place of refuge for the city where all the trash is done. In fact where the animals after being sacrificed, they, their bodies would be taken. It was a 
there is a wretched stench. In fact, it's from that name we get Gehenna. You know, we talk about hell, the stench and the ugliness and the rottenness of all that hell is. And Jesus is made to walk through and near that place. And then he takes him up the next side of the little mountain facing Jerusalem from the other side up to Caiaphas's house. And there's steps that those who've been in recent years were, were uncovered, those steps were. And we walked around and down those steps just below Caiaphas's palace. But where they took him was, is into the, the, the palace of Caiaphas as he begins to go away to these trials. It says here, as he's led to Gethsemane, all this had taken place to fulfill the scripture of the prophets. And all the disciples, when he said that, they left and fled. And those who had seized Jesus, they led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. Now this begins the trials of the Lord Jesus Christ. As he goes through these trials, understand there's about six different hearings that take place. Three of the hearings were before uh, the Jewish authorities, and three of these were before Roman authorities. But ultimately, six trials and six verdicts that are given about the Lord Jesus as he goes through this process. And this is what I want us to look at. First, going to Caiaphas' palace. Remember, as he gets there, it's still nighttime. Sun's not come up. It's hours probably before the dawn. And he goes into Caiaphas' house. And th as he gets there, there's this great assembly of high-ranking Jewish officials. They've all gathered there to be a part, to hear what's going on, and to, to make some decisions in regard to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a council of 70 rulers of Israel who will be present for this. And there will be next to them the representatives of the four and the 20 classes of the, of the priesthood. There will be the elders. The rulers of the synagogue will be gathered. And they'll also be surrounded by eminent doctors of the laws and the leading rabbis. Their job, ultimately, of this particular group is to observe and to maintain the ordinances of the law and of, of their religion, to watch over the purity of doctrine, to make sure that what's being taught by the rabbis and the leaders is pure doctrine. They're part of, a, ultimately, a priestly role, a divine service. And they're there in normally to examine and to judge doctrines and teachings and heresies. As Jesus is brought up there before this room, he's brought before Annas, who's not even the high priest. He's the, high, he's the past high priest. He used to be the high priest, but now Caiaphas is the high priest, and Annas is his father-in-law. And the first thing he does is he stands before this group of possibly a hundred people or more. The Lord Jesus stands there as a prisoner, and they begin to interrogate him over his doctrine. If you follow the story carefully in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they begin to examine him on what his teachings are and what he's saying, he'd be, he, he doesn't seek to defend himself at all. He begins to literally defend the message, not himself. And he basically says to them, listen, I was with you in the temple every day. You want to know what I said? You heard what I said. In fact, and this is where he calls them on a little point of the law, they can't have him there unless somebody is there to testify that he did preach something incorrectly. He said, there are many people who heard, not only have you heard, why don't you ask them? Now, that's not arrogance. That was what they were supposed to do. But at this point, when he says that, why are you asking me? In other words, you should be asking them if you're going to do what you're supposed to do, find out what I taught, Ask, why are you asking me? At that point, that's when Anna's servant smites him and why are you talking to the high priest this way? Don't tell us how to do what we're here to do. Why are you talking to him this way? And by the way, that's the first mistreatment soon to be followed by other mistreatments by the Sanhedrin as well as by the Gentiles and Pilate and Herod and the soldiers. But Jesus' answer to Annas was embarrassing for him because at this point there is no others to be giving testimony. They'll do this in a, a, a moment of time later on, but not at this particular hearing. And so he has no answer. He really doesn't know what to say. Now, we don't know how long he's there, whether he's held for hours or a couple of hours or whatever it might be, but this is the first of the hearings. Now, there's a point where Jesus is led out of Caiaphas' place. It Caiaphas, for those, again, who were, have been to there, to that location, that the foundation and the basement and the lower section of Caiaphas' palace still remains today. They've built a Catholic church over it called the, the Church of St. Peter in Caligantu, which is basically the church of the Cock that Crows, all right? But below that church are the original 
foundations and rooms of Caiaphas' palace. And even in there, when you go down to the lower parts, there's a place where prisoners would be held, where someone would be beaten. There's even a pit where they would keep somebody if they had to detain someone overnight. And Jesus would have been lured into this pit. Many believe that Psalms 22 is that prophetic psalm which gives inference to what took place in, in that, that particular pit. But whether it's here or sometime later, we know that, that it's, at one point Jesus is let out of Caiaphas' palace. And when he's let out, you remember, outside Caiaphas' palace in a courtyard, there were people who had begun to gather. In fact, Malchus's children and family were there. The guy who'd been, his ear had been cut off. And guess who shows up as well to warm himself up by fire in the inner court? It was Peter. And Peter shows up at this time, and they began to talk to Peter and discover he has a Galilean accent. Oh, you must, I've seen you. you no, you don't know me. I, I don't know him. And three times he denies the Lord. And as the cock is crowing or for that last time, Jesus steps out into the courtyard, still bound as a prisoner, and Peter and Jesus make eye contact. Now, we'll talk about that more next week. That's your commercial announcement, all right? But you'll want to be here for that as we talk about what, how he responds there. But, you know, ultimately, Jesus is taken, as time goes by, to another place. And this is something, you know, in studying this for years, I've been looking at this, and I began to realize that there is, Jesus is being led out of Caiaphas. Where is he being led to? Well, it's still dark. I mean, the cock just now crowed. It's, the dawn has not come, and it's, it's at daylight when they end up at Pilate's house. They're taking him up to the temple. And they have to take him to the temple because that's the official meeting that all the Sanhedrin gathers. And that's where they take him, and they, they have basically a secondary trial there. At Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin are gathered there, and now Caiaphas is going to speak, not just Annas to him. And when Caiaphas begins to speak to him, Jesus gives no reply at first, all right? He just stands there. The Bible says he's led. He doesn't open his mouth. He's led like a lamb to the slaughter, and he, he stands before his accuser. He stands there as a sacrifice for our sins, the spotless lamb of God. He's the accused, like the lamb to the slaughter, as the scripture says. And Jesus is that lamb. Now remember, this is Passover. This is Passover, when, and it's that time, and probably at this early hour, the first of the people who are bringing sacrifices of their family lamb up to the temple have already started making their way up to the gates. It's in this little group of people, among these people who are carrying their sheep or leading their sheep up to be sacrificed. They've had him in their home for several days. They've watched him to make sure he has no spot, no blemish, no disease, all right? He has to be offered one per family, and he has to be offered in the right way. He has to be without blemish. As they're carrying their lambs, here comes the temple guard, along with leaders of the temple, bringing another lamb, the true lamb. This is the lamb that John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the Lamb of God that tells us before time and eternity begin as we understand it. The Bible talks about a lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. This is God's lamb, all right? He is ultimately the first lamb and will soon be the last real necessary lamb to be offered. He is the Alpha. He's the Omega. And he comes into this area to be examined like every lamb had to be examined by the priesthood. And as he stands before them, and as they begin to speak to him, there, there are things said. And then ultimately, nobody's getting what they want. They can't find a point to accuse him. So what they begin to do, the Bible says they bring forth bribed witnesses to testify against him. Basically, to come tell a lie. It had to be a lie. He's never done anything wrong. He is spotless. He's sinless. The Bible says, let me reiterate it. He who knew no sin becomes sin. And as he stands there, the false witnesses are brought in to make accusation, all right? And in the darkness of that room, as Jesus stands there, and he's already been smitten, and he's already covered in blood from the prayer, you know, he stands there as that accused lamb, and he opens not his mouth. And finally, when all the witnesses have finished, there's a problem. None of them correspond. They, you know, they should have had a little meeting before and made sure everybody's story was the same. But the liars fail at their job. The stories are conflicting. The words are conv convoluted. They, they, it doesn't mesh, all right? It wouldn't pass muster in any court of law. And so that's dismissed. High priest is standing there. What are we going to do? 
I believe at that moment when Caiaphas stands up and makes the next statement that what he says was most likely put into his heart and to his mind by God himself. What am I going to do now? Ah, oh, I've got an idea. Well, let's see just what he does in Matthew 26. So we make a reference here in verses 62 through 68. And the high priest stood up and said to him, Do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus finally speaks. You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you how uh, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his robe, saying, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? Now it's time for the jury to rise. And they answered, He is deserving of death. And they spat on his face, and they beat him with their fist, and others slapped him. And they said, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? They all give this reassounding agreement that the Lord is worthy of death. Why is he worthy of death? The high priest asked him the question, Are you the Son of God? Again, the more I pour over this, each year it's like God just reveals something. That's the beauty of Scripture. No matter how much you study it, you just keep getting more and more and more. You know, there, there's a saying among the Eastern religions, uh, Islam, Judaism, that goes like this in the in renunciation of Jesus deity is that, you know, God is one, he has no son. But yet the high priest, and this, you know, for whatever reason, I'd crossed over it before, I just never really got what he was saying. He asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the living God? I didn't know that the Jews, especially the high priest, believed that God had a son. You know, in Genesis it says, and God said, let us make man after our own image. And when God created the heavens and the earth, he did it in, under the reference to name, his name Elohim, which is a plural for God. So there's more to God than meets the eye. We talked about God is a trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And literally, what he's asking here is from Daniel chapter 7, around verses 31, 32, when Daniel is making reference that in those end times, that one, as the Son of God, would come to the Ancient of Days, and that the Ancient of Days would in turn give to that one all authority and all dominion. And so he's making reference here, and to which Jesus finishes the reference for him. Yes, I am, and hereafter, as Daniel said, you shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of glory, just like it said in Daniel 7. So what a great moment as Jesus testifies. Now the rest of the night, whether it's later in the night or early in the night, there's one part where he's held overnight. And this is where you get that prophetic Psalms of Psalms 22. As Jesus goes in, he's talking about being broken and offered and a worm and no man, being delivered to a pent, being surrounded by those who wag their heads and save yourself. You say to say, well, that prophetic Psalm is given. But whether it's that moment here at this point or later on, earlier on, when the first trip to Caiaphas' house, you see the Lord Jesus Christ. Suffering, accused, blameless at the same time, bloody, spat upon, beaten by these men. You know, you have to come to some agreement here with the Jews and with the Sanhedrin. When it comes to Jesus, there's no middle ground. I mean, really can't. He either is who he says he is or he's not. And if he's not who he says he is, like these men said, then he is a liar He's a false prophet, and he's a blasphemer. But if he is who he says he is, then he's the Lord. I think it's C.S. Lewis who made that great statement. I've heard it quoted by many different preachers. He said, Jesus, either, he's either the Lord or he's lunatic and liar. He would have to be filled with lunacy. He'd have to be an absolute crazy man to testify about himself that he's God's son if he's not God's son, because what's getting ready to happen to him, he'd have to be out of his mind. Crazy or just a really good liar who's willing to pay the price for whatever his lie has been said. But he's neither liar nor lunatic. He is Lord. And he stands there as the Lord to be the, uh, the offering for our sins, to be all, everything that we needed God to be for us, because we cannot be what we need to be, because we have all fallen short of the glory of God. 
Now, it's at this point, again, we'll talk about this a little bit more. Next week, we get into Judas's remorse and Judas's suicide. When he comes in and he sees what's happening now, perhaps for whatever reason, there's a lot of different opinions about why Judas sold out Jesus, some to say to put him on the spot so he would take his place of authority, to pressure him into it. Others just say out of greed. But whatever reason is here, he has that 30 pieces of silver, and now he sees that Jesus is going to die. They're going to kill him. And so he goes back to the leaders and throws the money on the ground in the temple and says, you know, I've betrayed innocent blood. And he goes out and he hangs himself. Priests sweep up the money and go and buy a field where Judas hung himself. Today it's still known as Potter's Field, where he was buried. You see Peter denying the Lord. You see Judas denying the Lord, but you see different responses. How long has gone by, we don't know exactly, but now it's time. The sun's come up. It's morning time. Now Pilate's judgment hall is awaiting because the Jews can't do anything of themselves because all authority has now been, you know, they're under Roman domination. They can't make these life and death decisions anymore. So they've led to the fortress of Antonio. Your Bible might call it the Praetorium, but that's where, you know, the judgment has to take place. And the whole of the Sanhedrin takes Jesus over there. Here's 175 to 100 men taking Jesus up to Pilate's judgment hall. And when they get there, they shove Jesus in because they're not going to go in themselves because Passover is upon them and they can't defile themselves by surrounding themselves with Gentiles. So they push him inside and they stay outside. Catch what happens here as they get over there and says here that, that Pilate therefore entered into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered are you saying this on your own initiative? Or did others tell you about me? And Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? You're, you, your own nation and the chief priest delivered you up to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered and said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered up to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So here's Pilate. He's asking him, are you a king? Go on a little bit farther. He says, Pilate therefore said to him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I've been born, and for this I've come to the world, to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault. I find no guilt in him. So there's this conversation that begins with Pilate, who asked him, are you a king? Which Jesus says, I am a king but my kingdom's not of this world. Now, Pilate, he's kind of torn here. If you, you read it carefully, no matter how you look at it, no matter how many times you read it, no matter how good or bad or unrighteous or wicked this man was, he just doesn't know what to do with Jesus. He's talking to this man. He's already been given a little note from his wife that says, don't have anything to do with this guy. I had this dream last night. Don't, don't, don't have anything to do with him. So Pilate, you know, with orders from mama, not Caesar, he's not quite sure what to do at this point. But then can you imagine, here's the son of glory standing in your midst. Here is a man who every word that comes out of his mouth is unadulterated and pure. Who everything he says is right on. And it's not only backed up by saying, well, is he telling the truth? You know, his whole character, his personage, everything about him is the truth. How do you deal with that? And so he's standing there, and he really, there's something going on here. I don't, I don't do this. I don't know how to handle this. And are you, are you, well, if you've heard the truth, you'd know that I'm a king, you know. Everybody who is of my kingdom knows the truth. And then he asked him that question, which the world's still asking today, what is truth? What do you mean truth? What, 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 what is truth? Obviously, there are still people asking and still people searching, but you don't ever find the truth until you come to Jesus Christ and discover that he is the way and the truth and the life. And that all life and all grace and all mercy will flow only from him. I find no fault in him. It's interesting. There was a saying among those in, the, in that day. It was an ancient saying. that it, only if God came down would it be possible for men to attain what is sure or what is truth. Well, God did come down. And God's son came down. And he is the truth. And standing before Pilate to answer his question is not just a vocalized answer. It's a man God clothed in flesh who stands there is the absolute truth and Pilate is just not sure what to do. So he sends him away to Herod. Maybe this is a way out. I mean, you know, politics, pass it down to the next guy. Kick the can down the road, so to say. Well, Herod, remember, this is the same Herod who John the Baptist in the wilderness was preaching about and rebuking for his immoral lifestyle. 
And he's the one who had John brought in and detained, ultimately had him beheaded at the request of family members. You know, what's he do? Jesus, I've heard about you. Heard you do miracles. Do some magic. Do, do a trick for me. And Jesus does not give an answer. You know, there's still people doing the same today. Oh, if God's God, he'll do this. If God were God, you know, if God, why didn't God do this? Uh, maybe you were a little kid, you ever lie in bed at night and looking up in the dark room and say, okay, God, if you're real, you come in this room and turn the light on. You're probably smiling because you may have done that. <laughs> if you're really real, come turn this light on. But Jesus doesn't perform. In fact, Jesus has already manifested his light and his answer. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. Read Romans chapter 1. It talks about the stars and, and the heavens and the, the, the world and creation itself is an absolute statement of divinity that God is God and that he is in all authority and he's in all control, that, that there's none greater than him. The Bible tells us in the Gospel of John, the very first chapter, that he is the light of the world and he lights every man who's ever born. I don't understand that completely. But I know that God is a righteous God and reveals himself on some level to every person that's ever been born. And they either reject that or they accept it. And here's Herod. He's too busy trying to be macho. He's too busy trying to be the king, Herod, who's just a mock king himself. And they do the same thing to Jesus. They pretend to make a mock king of him by placing a robe on him and a scepter and smiting and pushing him around, which is later carried on out by the Roman soldiers themselves. Herod basically says, as a result of this, you know, there, there's nothing that he's done that's worthy of death, and he says the same thing as Pilate. I find no fault in him. Nothing wrong with him. Get him out of here. I don't have to deal with this. And he sends him on to Pilate. Back to Pilate. And he's returned to Pilate's judgment hall again for another little brief tribunal, another little trial that takes place. And he stands before Pilate again. And again, as you read the Gospels, some of these are combined, and you don't see Herod's taking place in this. But if, and once you kind of lay out the, the harmony of the Gospels and look at them all, this is the way that, that I see the pieces all come back together. And as he stands before you know, Pilate again at the judgment hall, Pilate seems to kind of be making an effort to, to be neutral. You know, I, I really don't know what to do with him. I, I, I'm not sure what we're going to do here. But let me tell you, when you stand face to face with a decision about Jesus, you can't be neutral. Jesus made it very clear, if you're not for me, then you're against me. If you're not gathering with me, then you're scattering. There's a lot of people today who want to just kind of talk about faith and talk about Jesus and kind of stay in a kind of a neutral context. It just doesn't work that way. So what finally he does, well, I don't know, dude, maybe I'll figure out a way to get this guy free. So he comes up with the, this old tradition of Barabbas, all right? In John 18, Pilate said to them, he says to Jesus, what is truth? And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews and he said to them, I find no fault in him. And then he, he says, I, you know, we have this custom that I release someone to you at Passover. You, you can do with them then that I, who do you want me to release to you? This, this, this person, this prisoner, or do I release the, the king of the Jews? And it says, so they cried out again, saying, not this man. We don't want him. Give us Barabbas. In fact, it goes on to say, now Barabbas was a robber. Barabbas was a thief. So what am I going to do with Jesus? Well, I guess we'll punish him. We'll do something. So he hands him over to the soldiers. And those who've read this passage is clearly from the Gospels and you've read the description or you've looked at history and you've seen how history records these Roman scourgings and beatings and you've seen just how, how terrible this treatment is and how life-threatening. A lot of people never even survived the scourgings that, that, that the Romans gave. And you've seen the descriptions. It says that they took Jesus and they stripped his garments off of him. You know, we say where he's been blindfolded, he's been struck. And even by the soldiers, there's this, this picture of them doing the same things. And then the scourging takes place. The worst part of the scourging was that beating where they would take the whips. And they, those whips, remember, as we, you've seen perhaps even in some of the movies that have portrayed this, like the Passion, that the, the, the whips, like cats of nine tails whips they were called, each strand of leather, the nine strands of leather coming off, would be embedded and the end of it would have a, a nail or some metal or glass or something that would, would, would shred the flesh as it would come across the back. Most Roman scourgings took place with two Roman soldiers. 
Jesus would either be tied around a post where his back was exposed or he'd be held between two posts where his arms would be tied up and one soldier would stand on one side of the victim and another soldier would stand on the other side of the victim, both with whips in their hands. And as the first soldier would take the, the lash, the whip would lay across the flesh, there was, a, there was an action that would be taken so that it would do its full damage. It would come across with great strength and power, but they would pop the wrist so that the flesh or the metals or those things would literally grab the, the hide, all right? It would grab the flesh of Jesus and catch it so that when they pull the whip back, it would strip the flesh back. Then the soldier up on the other side would do something the same way from the other side where he would strike him and then jerk it back. 39 times. 39 times. They called it, this is where the term comes, being beaten with an inch of your life. Because so much of the muscle, the tissue, the flesh had been torn at. There was only a, a thin layer that was still holding the organs in so they wouldn't come pouring out on the ground. And this is how Jesus suffered. And every point from Gethsemane where the blood is being shed to Caiaphas's, over to the Sanhedrin's meeting at the temple, back to Pilate, to Herod, Everywhere he goes, someone's striking him. And every step he takes, blood is being shed for our sins. The Bible says it very clearly. Without the shedding of blood, there's no removal of our sins. People say, well, that Christian thing, that's a bloody religion. You bet it is. Because there's no way that you or I can be saved. You have sinned. I have sinned. The wages of sin is death. Somebody's going to have to die to pay for your sins. And if you try to do it yourself, you'll never pay for it because your offering is not acceptable because it's tainted by sin. So the only recourse is for you to spend eternity under judgment. There's never going to come a place in hell you say, okay, I did my sentence. It's not like being given a prison sentence. You, you're doomed. I'm doomed. We have no help if someone doesn't come pay the price for our sins. And the Bible says, like this spotless lamb, he was led to the slaughter, and he's beaten, and he's scourged, and he gets to this point, as Isaiah said, that you could not even identify him. The book of Isaiah prophesied that his visage was so marred, so beaten, so swollen, so scarred, so cut, you wouldn't recognize him if you knew him as your best friend. No one could identify him. This point, after this terrible beating, the crown of thorn is placed upon his head. It's a mock robe. One place says a scepter like at Herod's place was given to him. And they begin to shout to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Does that satisfy the Sanhedrin? Does that satisfy the law? Pilate takes him back to the Sanhedrin who's standing at the gate. And he brings out Jesus wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. In the Latin, there's a term called eke homo, behold the man. So when the chief priest and the officers beheld him, saw him, they cried out saying, crucify, crucify. And Pilate said to them, then you take him yourselves and you crucify him. I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, we have a law and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. Their true words were never spoken. They never realized that this is exactly what God had in mind for his son. The Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. And Jesus is about to go be hung on that tree to be the absolute curse. The Bible says at this point, and we'll talk about this next week and the week following, then they led Jesus out to be crucified. Like a lamb to the slaughter. At the same time, sacrifices are being prepared for the altar in the Holy of Holies. It's amazing. When Jesus stood before the high priest, he rent his clothing. Remember when Jesus said, I am? By the way, there's more symbolism to that than what most. It wasn't just symbolism. He was horrified. From another perspective, it's a symbolism that that priesthood is over. It's done. And in fact, since Jesus' prophecies were fulfilled about the temple being destroyed, and they were fulfilled, 
that there's not ever been another lamb sacrificed on an altar. Because the ultimate lamb, the lamb of God, has been slain. But no matter where you look in all these passages of these particular verses in regard to the trials and Jesus standing before people, everywhere he goes, decisions are made. And every time the gospel, every time Jesus is really presented to us, isn't it the same? We make decisions. We always have to make a decision. What are you going to do with Jesus? You can, you can do like, you know, the, those were the religious. The religious didn't want anything to do with him because if they accept who he is, then he has to be the Lord over them, right? He's going to be in charge. Nobody wants to give up that political power. We can't have this man over us. And so they push him because they don't want his authority. And that's the same thing that people do today when presented with Jesus. I don't want him telling me what to do. I'm my own person. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. He's taken before Pilate, and Pilate, I believe he's swayed by the very presence of Jesus, and the, even though bloody and wounded, he's, there's probably such dignity and such grace and such presence about Jesus that blows his mind. I, I, I don't, there's nothing, nothing worthy of, I, I, there's no guilt here. There's nothing, I find no fault in him. There's a lot of people today will try to be neutral. Ultimately, we see how Pilate washes his hands of the whole thing before the crowd. Hey, can't wash your hands and just say, I don't want to think about it. There's a lot of people today, they just push Jesus off. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to deal with it. I don't, you know, talk to me about Jesus stuff. I, I'm not interested in that. And they're like Pilate. But you have to do something here. Again, Jesus said, if you're not for me, then you're against me. If you're sitting there today and say, well, I really don't want, you know, I've kind of written Jesus off. He's religious and all that good stuff. But I, I don't want to kind of, I don't participate in that. Then you're like Pilate or even like Herod, you know, who just said, well, there's no guilt to hear. I, I, I push him off somewhere else. Back ultimately to the Sanhedrin who says, crucify him. You say, well, I would never do that. It is within our nature to do that. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Because we don't want to be exposed, become vulnerable, see that we are. Look at our failures, look at our son, our sins, our, our emptiness. We decide not to decide or just to do away with him. Say, well, who's guilty here of the blood of Jesus? We all are. You can blame the Jews, you can blame Herod, Pilate, the Romans, whoever you want to, but ultimately... The Bible says he became sin for you and me. First John puts it away. He was our stand-in, our propitiation. And not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. You know, you know who should have been standing there? You, me. Who should have been beaten? You, me. Who should have been nailed to a cross? You, me. We, we're the sinners. He's known no sin. So as we look at Jesus today and we're presented with him and these trials take place, there's a trial that goes on in your own heart and mind this morning. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Christ? I pray you've already made that decision. 1973, I settled that issue. I want to be what God wanted me to be. I wanted his life over my life. I wanted him to rule my life and be my king, be my Lord and be my savior. There's a lot of times that I've been in the pursuit of that as a believer. Uh, yeah, I've made some mistakes. Like Peter, there's been some denials. Maybe not near as public. But in remorseful repentance, find grace and mercy and forgiveness. Praise God. Maybe you're at that place like Peter. You've been in a place as a follower, a genuine follower of Jesus, but you've been going through some denials in your life. And the place of authority that he used to have in your heart is not really there anymore. You're trying to kind of push him off the side. You need to get your heart right with God today. That great passage in 1 John that talks about it, you know, God's faithful and just. He's just because the price has been paid. He's just to forgive you your sins. So confess your sins to him. Let God wash you and cleanse you. Let a revival start in your life. Maybe you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're religious. Maybe you acknowledge. But yet when it comes to him to have an authority over you, Jesus said there's going to be many in that day who will say, but didn't we do all these things in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. The Bible, Paul, Peter talked about those who would have a, uh, Paul talked about those who would have a form of godliness but deny the power of it. That's not what we want. We want God and his power living in our lives. So as the Lord stands in the courtroom of your heart and your mind today, what's the verdict? Will you embrace him as king, lord and leader? 
or you try to push him off of something else. Make that decision. We really do it on a daily basis, don't we? If it's never been made in your life, you know what? Life awaits you today. You're never really going to be full of life until you understand who he is and that he, his very presence in your life is what life's all about. God didn't create man to live isolated and alone from him and apart from him. God created you to walk with him and to know him. So if you don't know him, then you're missing out on life. You're missing out on the, the very destiny of your life. You're created to know God. Give your life and heart to Jesus Christ today. Let's stand. And as we do today, there'll be some people who are going to come to this altar this morning. These men appear. Every one of us are here to be praying.